Look at this. It's so cold, my gloves froze. Hey guys, welcome back to day number three of our field expedition. It's currently 7 a.m. We're on our way to the first field site today. We have three to visit. This one's about an hour and a half away. We should be there for six hours. So about mid-afternoon, we should be finished here and on to the next one. Wait, can I try it under here? Put this in. Ah, oh, I need a box. Can't reach it. GPS is on, modem's on. So we've just finished at the first site and we're gonna to go to the second one now. This is about a two hour drive away and it is called BB20. It's right down by the base of the crack, so it's quite an interesting site. If you're wondering what these sites do, why they're there and this whole crack situation, I've got loads of videos on my channel and I'll put a little link in the description and on the page now. Uh, after this, we'll head back to the base where the final site is and we'll raise that as much as we can today. We'll have some dinner, maybe some whiskey, we'll have a bit of a chill out and then repeat for tomorrow. The ice shelf is quite a sterile place. I mean, there's no mountains, there's no life, there's nothing really to look at. So driving for ages can get a bit monotonous. But every now and then, a bird will randomly fly out of nowhere towards your face and it's a bit alarming but also it's incredibly entertaining it breaks up the drive really nicely and i believe this is because i mean there's there's no life down here so when they see movement on the ice shelf they want to investigate they're curious and i mean they're, they're not afraid of anything because there's, no, there's nothing there to kill them and they want to see if there's food for them um so yeah you'll be driving along and the snow petrol starts weaving in and out of your convoy hovering above you darting up and down it's so acrobatic it's a really nice sight to see so yeah, snow petrels are my new favourite bird. Go you snow petrels. Hey, is uh, James there? Yeah, it's Jazz. <laughs> okay, cheers. Fantastic, thank you very much. All right. Cheers, have a good day, bye. Oh, yeah, we're good. Yes, sir. You got the alignment right. Lifetime of Halley is a unique experiment because it's giving operational data, not scientific data. So we need to see this sort of data back in Cambridge live. So that big antenna is relaying all the information about the GPS point back to Halley Base, which is sending it on through to Cambridge. So I rung up James to make sure I got the bearing of the antenna right and he was getting a strong signal. And it looks like he is, so we are good. It's been quite a long day, but we're back at base now. So we've got one more site to race, but before that we have to put the skidoos to sleep. Now what that means is bringing them with petrol, putting more oil if they need it, and then covering them with a tarp. This is essential because if there's a storm and the intake that clogged up with snow, we suddenly don't have any transport and we're 20 kilometers away from Halley Base in the middle of Antarctica.
cool. We're getting started. I'm just gonna go. So it's um, eight o'clock at night, and we've just finished an LOH site. It was a lot of digging. Um, we have two more to do after this, and then another AP res, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, but we only have two days to do it, so I'm gonna go start on the next one. Oh, it's a lot of digging. We've got to lift these uh, 100 kilo battery boxes, two of them, two and a half meters out the ground after we dig to it. So we're moving around three quarters of a ton of snow by hand. And then we've got to redig those holes on the other side and transfer them. And I'll do the whole shebang, I'll explain it later on. But uh, this is our tent. We've got a tilly lamp, gloves hanging up. You have a um, primer stove, lots of food, lots of ration packs. We have the stove stuff in here. We've got some food in here. We've got two more, another food box there, another food box there, and outside there. We've got these uh, sheepskin rugs, which are quite nice. Big, thick sleeping bags. And you overheat every night just because the insulation is so good. So. Yeah, let's get digging. Are you getting a signal? Uh, programming. Little beans. So just for a bit of information about our base camp, at the end of every day, Taff piles fresh blocks of snow by the base of the tent, and we can just lean out, grab a fresh block, put it in the pot, and melt some water to drink. We melt enough for the next day and for quite a few teas because we are British. Yeah, day four. I'm losing track of days here. But we're heading back out to the AP res, which is by the crack tip. We visited this on day one and we dug a lot, but we couldn't find the electronics boxes and we couldn't find any of the wires that we need to. So we're having another crack. We have wrong base and they've looked through the archives and they've given us a better idea of where the electronics are. So we've got the whole day to raise this whole site. And then on another expedition, we're gonna go drive to the crack tip and reinstall it so we can measure the distance of the crack as it's growing. It's completely snapped that connector. Did you know that the Inuits have 50 words for different types of snow? Snow has a lot of different consistencies, textures, densities, and you really learn how to maneuver different types of snow when you're down here. And you go through different layers. So here at, the, at this instrument, the top layer is really nice and compact and you can dig out massive blocks, but as you go down, it goes icy and hard and jars your wrist when you hit it with a shovel. And then you hit a really powdery layer, which is really hard to shovel. So it's quite interesting how your technique changes. And Ollie started the hole the size of the electronics board. And this means that by the time he gets to the bottom, the hole's gonna taper in and he'll be digging a postage stamp size square. So I'm trying to widen the hole so we can actually reach the electronics and pull them out of the hole. Long. What do you think that? That could be the reds there. Oh. <sighs> 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 
talking about the time. So snow is a fantastic insulator. So on the surface, when the temperature is varying, if you go about a meter under, you get a really stable temperature and we're about four meters under. So at the bottom year round, it's pretty much minus 20 degrees with very little fluctuation. But that means that all the metal down here is so cold. If you touch it with your bare skin, it will freeze instantly just because of the thermal mass and how cold it is. And you're gonna have a hard time removing that finger from that pole. I actually touched one of the electronics boxes which was crystallized and freezing and I lost a fingerprint. So if I was going to murder anyone, it would be now. Um, that was a joke, of course, uh, maybe a bad one. I'm thinking rope going down, people on top just pulling, and then someone every now and then a shovel in the side just to act like a shelf to take a rest. <laughs> Oh wow, everything's really sticky. Yes. <laughs> Can I come down and get a photo sticking up in the hole? Yeah, of course. I need to get up. I'm gonna... It's about the biggest hole you've ever seen, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got it? Oh, just. raising the AP res which measures the distance across the gap um, it's a second day digging that would be seven days of uh, digging straight my body hurts um, yeah we finally reached the electronics which are the batteries the electronics boards the wind generator controller and the solar power controller and all the antennas We're about four meters down uh, I'll show you the aftermath. So it's getting pretty late in the day and it's getting pretty cold, but we just wanted to test the equipment before we take it back to Halley Base. On the other side of the crack is a reflector and one antenna is transmitting and one is receiving. So it sends a broadband signal or a burst across the crack and then looks at the time delay and also the phase delay. I'm not sure exactly how, but it works out to the nearest millimeter of the distance across the crack. It looks like it worked, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna pile it all up, make sure it's all nice and safe, and then tomorrow we'll pick it up, load it up onto the sledge and take it all back to Halley Base where we'll do some more um, repairs on it and then reinstall it on the crack tip. So we just finished digging up AP res. Um, yeah, it's about four, meet, four and a half meters under the ground, which is pain I to dig up. Two antennas, two battery boxes, all the electronics and a wind turbine and a solar panel. So these were my gloves from today. They froze while I was wearing them. Have a look. So while you watch me boil some water, I wanted to answer some questions. So I had a question from someone who asked, what food do we eat and where is it stored? So the food is quite old. The last time a ship was brought into Halley was about four years ago. So all the food we're eating is about four years old. We have enough rations for, I think, at least six or seven years. 
um, but next year we should bring a ship in. The food is stored in something called the buried container. Now, under the, the surface of the snow, the temperature is actually really constant. It's maybe around minus 20 year round. So we have a buried container. So even during summer, it will never defrost. And the food is actually pretty good. A four year old steak isn't that bad. The chefs are incredible and yeah, I'm very happy with the food down here. So if you have any questions, please fire away in the comments. I will try and get to you as quickly as I can. Internet's not the best here, but yeah. Um, thank you for watching. And if you feel like I've earned your subscription, please do subscribe. Um, I will try and get more content out there. And yeah, let me know what you want to see. I think that would be great.